Hi, I'm Guy Wallace, and this is video number four in my adventures in performance-based training and development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. Note, I've also titled, subtitled this series of videos, The Insomnia Solution. Not for my insomnia, but for yours. Just kidding. This video is going to overview my time at Epic Incorporated, my current firm, and my three years overlapping with Wachovia, which I joined, and then the financial crisis took over back in 2008, and it uh, was merged or bought up by Wells Fargo. We'll talk a little bit about that later. I started Epic Incorporated uh, after shutting down Caddy. Epic is the Enterprise Process Performance Improvement Consultancy, and Caddy was the Curriculum Architecture Design and Development Institute. I ran that for five years. I was the majority stakeholder, shareholder. I started that company up after leaving Ray Svensson uh, after 15 years in 1997. So this is 2002 until today. The consulting work that I've been involved in at Epic, uh, always very interesting and usually focused on CADS, Curriculum Architecture Design a performance-based oriented way to build a training and development path, much later called learning and development paths. Um, again, I've published articles, uh, co-authored articles on curriculum architecture design via a group process back in 1984 with Training Magazine. So this is a proven process, a methodology that I've been using for a long time. I myself have done 76 of these curriculum architecture design projects since 1982. I'd done my very first one when I was at Motorola back in 1981. A project that I think is a pretty interesting was one that I did for the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. And this was a curriculum architecture design effort focused on two jobs, two management jobs, supervisors and zone managers, the supervisor's boss, with the production organization. The intent of the project <clears throat> was to do these first two levels of management in the production organization and then take the methodology to the other organizations. So the quality organization, the uh, HR organization, uh, all across the entire shipyard. <clears throat> My premise was that what a supervisor needs in each one of these functional areas is pretty much the same. There's some unique things because of the nature of the function that they're working within and the people that they're managing but uh, so that we were going to do this as the pilot project and then we we're going to take it across the organization one at a time and uh, go after the reuse potential of instructional content uh, and that could include the instructional content could include standalone job aids or what's nowadays called performance support or job aids performance support embedded in training or training when we really need people to memorize uh, portions of their job tasks and what to do and how to do it uh, and when we have to hone particular skills where one uh, e-learning module or self-paced module wouldn't be sufficient um, but th that's what we were trying to do and uh, unfortunately because of the conflicts overseas the United States Navy didn't have any money to continue the project after that. So the group was a, a civilian organization dedicated to the support of the United States Navy. Um, the shipyard is one of the uh, largest, I think, in in the Navy system. Um, anyway, home port to a lot of people that uh, uh, ride around on the U.S. Naval warships. The the project was uh, uh, followed a standard approach. There was phase one, the project planning and kickoff phase, where I met with the client and other key stakeholders and formed a project steering team. Now the secret of forming a project steering team is to get all the stakeholders, people who have a stake in the outcomes about this project. They have to live with the, pro the products produced, the instructional products produced, and they live with the consequences of those being really good performance oriented, teaching people how to perform the job or they don't. And I also used the project steering team to leverage getting the 
right people involved in the project to do the right things at the right time. Too often we're given what uh, I used to call the friends of training, people who would show up and be able to support the training organization no matter what they were doing. Uh, what I found is that those people often had less than uh, good credibility with the, the client and the stakeholders. At one point I had a uh, analysis report thrown at me from the audience because certain people's names were on the first page as the sources for the content inside the analysis report. And uh, I learned a lesson from that. I, I learned to allow and insist on, in fact, that not just my client pick the people that I was going to work with, whether in a traditional sense, sense uh, in terms of observing their performance and interviewing them and reviewing documents that they would hand to me, but uh, in my preferred approach, was, which was the facilitated group process. Bring together the top master performers from the job family, people who know what this job is that we're going to uh, center this instruction on, other subject matter experts as necessary, sometimes supervisors and managers of the target audience, and sometimes novice performers so that we can uh, make sure that the needs of the new people coming in are well represented by somebody who's recently climbed the learning curve, has credibility in the organization, etc. Now, the trick to getting those right people involved is making sure that the project steering team the client and the stakeholders see the business sense in doing the project in the first place and engaging the right people because of the old saying, garbage in, garbage out, or good stuff in, good stuff out. And I've often used those phrases with the project steering team to make sure that they were going to give me the creme de la creme, the top people, the people we want others to emulate in terms of their performance, competence, and capabilities out on the job. It makes sense to them, but usually you're asking them to free up and lend to you uh, for a couple of three-day meetings, uh, minimally, um, their time. So they're off the job, they lose that performer and their performance capabilities on the job. And I try to sell that by suggesting that it's short-term pain for long-term gain. If we can get others to climb the learning curve quicker and with more of a focus on performance, they'll be more effective and we'll do this more efficiently. Um, and that's the goal. But the, 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 so the project uh, involved these top zone managers and the supervisors in the production organization. And the steering team picked a good group of people. I worked with them uh, as an analysis team to start with. And they did the performance modeling, which identifies, so what are the various chunks of the job? And I have a standard model that we start with when we do that. It's called the management areas of performance. And then we detail out within each one of these chunks or areas of performance, what are the outputs? What are the key measures? You know, How do we know a good one from a bad one? What are the tasks per output? What are the various roles and responsibilities in the task performance related to that output? So who's doing what? Oftentimes, process performance, human performance is not a solo activity. Usually there's other jobs or more than one person with the same job title involved in the various tasks to produce outputs. So we want to understand that. And when we get the consensus of that, which is not always easy to get, but when we get a consensus of that from the master performers, we're pretty assured that we've got the right focus on the terminal performance requirements of the people in the target audience. Um, we then systematically look at each of those areas of performance and the ideal performance that's been captured on flip chart pages normally um, to look at, so what are the gaps? For the people who are not master performers, what do the master performers think about those people and where are they falling short? And we always start with, here's the output and the measures, which measures aren't they meeting? And then we, so we identify that typical gap. We're not going after the occasional gap that once in every three blue moons or something like that. We're really looking for what are the trends? What are the things that are most often not attended to well enough? And we ask them, so what are the probable causes of that? And we capture that. And then we frame each one of those as either a deficiency of environment, 
the environment is not supportive enough, or it may be a deficiency of the performer's knowledge and skills because they don't know, they've not been taught, no one showed them the ropes, or it's because of deficiency of the individual's attributes and values. There's something else besides knowledge and skill which suggests that training, instruction, learning isn't going to solve the problem. So what, it, what is that? And so we can look at those and those really capture an articulation of the barriers in the performance context. Now, there's one thing about master performers that you can kind of generally say with some accuracy is that master performers know what those barriers are. They know how to avoid them in the first place, and if they're unavoidable, how to deal with them, how to resolve them, how to overcome uh, the barriers that maybe they, that were unavoidable for them. And so we do that with a group. It's the first half of a typically a three-day meeting or a four-day meeting, sometimes two if the scope is small. But when you're looking at an entire job, I usually start with my estimate as three days. And sometimes it looks, based on the scope and the complexity and everything, maybe it should have been a four-day meeting or a five-day meeting. So that's all decided up front, and that's what we do. That's what we invite them for. And we try to get everything done within the allotted time frame. But we take that performance model and we systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills. And I have 17 categories of enabling knowledge and skills and we can look at each chunk of the job and figure out, so what are the company policies and procedures that one must comply with? And once we've exhausted that across the entire job, across all these chunks of the job, the areas of performance, we go to the next category. So what are the uh, laws, regulations, and codes, and contracts, those things that are externally imposed on the organization that you must comply with when you're doing the job. And we systematically derive each of the knowledge and skill items. There may be industry standards. You may need to know about internal organizations and resources, you know, the corporate library, the material tools lockers, those kinds of things. And what external organizations and resources might you need to know about and utilize as you're doing your performance. Anyway, there's 17 categories of knowledge and skill. If you're interested in this, this is all covered in great detail in a couple of my books in Lean ISD from 1999 and in my Analysis of Performance Competence book, which came out in 2011. So the pro uh, so we, we did that analysis. There's two other chunks of analysis. We always want to understand, so who's the target audience? And ideally, this is done before you do this analysis team meeting. So we want to know who are the primary target audience, who are the secondary target audiences. Those secondary target audience members might get something from what we're doing, but we're not intending to focus on them and capture everything. If, if we wanted to do that, they would be in the primary target audience. So this is a signal, a way to be declarative to everyone. The primary is who we're going after. Everything that they need to do on the job, we're going to look at that. Doesn't mean we're going to develop content, instructional content or training content for all of that, but it's just that we want to understand the totality of their job performance requirements. Secondary target audience, there's going to be some overlap. Yeah, we get that, we understand that. And when we go to design and configure content, we're going to keep them in mind here so the organization can get the benefit of that. We also capture a short list, hopefully, of the tertiary audience, which means, which to me means we're not going, we don't care about them. People might get confused about the project and that we probably should have been going after them too, but we are not, and we're being declarative, we're not going to consider their performance requirements or their enabling knowledge and skill requirements. We're not. And if and so we declare that, we put that in presentations, we put that in reports, and if people say, hey, that's not right, then they can change that and we'll move them to the secondary or the tertiary or the primary target audiences and then attend to their needs. So that's the target audience analysis. That's hopefully, ideally, followed up by the analysis team mean, which then goes after the performance analysis and the enabling knowledge and skill analysis. When we understand the performance and the enabling knowledge and skill requirements, then it's time to do the fourth type of analysis within my methodology set. And that's to look at existing training and assess it for its reuse potential. Can we use it as is? And it'll be just fine, it's authentic enough, it'll really help them do the job. It, it's got to have more than face validity. It's got to have performance context validity. The, the instructional content and the performance context 
need to be authentic enough. Not perfectly, but authentic enough. And if it seems that it is, we'll designate it as content to be reused as is. Or if we say that content's close but not, not quite right, then we'll tag it as for reuse after modification. We may need to pull out the examples and the diagrams and some of the language and do plug and play and put in content that's more authentic for the audience that we're focusing on, for the primary target, target audience. Um, or there's content that we know that people will think, hey, you should have used that. And we looked at it and decided, no, it's not appropriate. It's too far. It sounds right, but it's not. And maybe the people who think that it should fit into the future training and development path, but we need to be declarative about that too. I found that it's much better to be declarative about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do, who you're going to tend to, who you're not going to tend to, what content you're going to reuse, what content you're not going to reuse, because that just helps people get a grip on that sooner rather than them reacting and then having to defend their reaction and then you're into all that kind of nonsense. So that's the analysis. That's all done in phase two analysis, which leads to a gate review meeting at the end of the phase where we meet back again with the project steering team, we review the analysis data, and then we do what I like. We answer all their questions and challenges about the details and where where's the data, and I go really high level and fairly quickly with them, but I have enough detail there that if they wanna go deep and see if something that they're concerned about, something that probably burned them back in the day when they had this job, or burned their organization in the past, and they want to know where that is. Where's the performance? Where's the knowledge and skills that people need? I show it to them. I've got to build their confidence that what we're doing is on track and headed in the right direction. So the gate review meeting, I tell the, the project steering team that you've got four decisions at the end of this meeting. This is how I kick off the meeting. You're either going to kill this project because it no longer makes business sense. Yes, we're doing it because it made business sense, but perhaps it no longer does. My clients are always uncomfortable when I start off this way, but I feel you got to let them know, hey, if this is not right, let's kill it, and Guy will go home and quit sending you invoices, and you know you can go do something else with your, uh, your shareholder equity or the funding that you've been given. Uh, the second choice is to defer what we're doing because something else has started happening and maybe we need to slow down and even stop and go on hold until that dust settles and we can decide what we need to do about it. And maybe there's an impact of what we're doing and maybe not. The third option is to amend our plan for going forward. We have a detailed project plan. Maybe we need to change that in some manner because that seems to be more appropriate now. Maybe that occurred to me and my analysis team and my client, or maybe it's something that the project steering team knows is going on, and they're gonna give us the heads up and say, you know, we, we need to change. We need to involve more people. There's a new person, new executive that's come on the job. Maybe we need to involve them. You know, many different places that that could come from, the, the need to change the plan. Uh, and be robust to whatever's going on in the organization. And the fourth option, my favorite of course, is to approve what data we're going to use in the design phase. You can see it all in the analysis data. We're gonna take that and we're gonna do a design with that. So approve that data and then approve our continued use of your valuable human assets, the master performers, subject matter experts, supervisors, novice performers, whomever, and it's usually the analysis team, a subset of that group, which is usually eight to 12 people. And I might want to take three or four of them and go do the design with them. And I'll usually pick the people who conceptually got what we were doing with analysis. No, we weren't there to create the training, which is often confusing. People come to these analysis team meetings thinking that we're going to start creating training. Well, no, we're going to analyze the job, analyze the knowledge and skill requirements, and then go feed the design phase with that data. Uh, but there's often times when the analysis team, when I tell them, okay, we're, I'm going to go to the steering team, I'm going to ask to take a subset of you, they've revolted and they've said, no, we're all coming. You know, don't, don't tell us that guy. We're all going to show up, make sure there's chairs and enough coffee and cookies or whatever for all of us because we're not going to invest all this time and energy to help you get it right and then to have you screw it up in the next step. We're not going to let that happen. Now, I'm fine with that. 
my clients, I've often said to them, hey, I'm only gonna take a subset. And they go, okay, that's less because you know they're not gonna wanna do this. They're not gonna wanna go to your meeting. We're gonna have to you know, like pull teeth to get these several people into the next phase, into the design phase. And they're often surprised, uh, happily surprised, that the entire analysis team insists that they're gonna be involved in the next step because that suggests to the client and to the project steering team and anybody else paying attention that we're on the right track and we're gonna do something that's very different and they wanna be a part of that. So it's kind of a manipulation on my part to kind of trick them into wanting to be, you know, I'll even say things like, well, I hope we don't screw it up in the next phase and they'll start worrying about that and then they'll wanna participate because I need the voice of the master performers to articulate the job and the knowledge and skills required and then I want them to be involved in the design. When we build a uh, training and development uh, path, nowadays called the learning path, I want the voice of those people, I, want, I, I would tell them, I own the process of what we're going to do and when we're going to do it and how we're going to do it and you own all the decisions because I don't know the job so I need that from you. I don't know what should be taught first, second and third you have a better feel for that. And uh, even if you're not right, we'll figure that out after we put it together and release it, pilot test it, and we'll, we'll fix it if, if necessary. But I found great success in leveraging those kinds of people in both analysis and design. Nowadays, you know, almost 40 years later, 35 years later, we're calling this stuff, you know, design thinking, uh, agile approaches to instructional design, you know, uh, a lot of new names for things that have been done in the past. The issue, of course, has been that not everybody was doing this kind of an approach before, and most, you know, it, when I do assessment of existing training content for reuse purposes, what I found is that what's missing from most of the content, most of the time, since 1982, are the, is a task orientation. Usually it's a bunch of topics that all have face validity. You hear the list of topics and you go, yeah, of course, <laughs> what? yeah. And because uh, they all make sense, it's all part of it. But what you find is that the content just stayed at the task level or at the topic level. It never said how to apply those topics, whatever the knowledge and skills were in the job context to aimed at performing tasks to produce outputs. Um, at best, it talks about tasks, but it doesn't even talk about the output you're supposed to produce and how you can tell a good one from a bad one. So those are the issues that my methodology has uh, tried to address since I first started doing these things back at Motorola in 1981 as a consultant in 1982. But that was a very interesting project. So we did the design. I took the entire analysis team because they insisted on it and meeting and we created a design for these two jobs. And so we developed a path for the supervisor. And then if you think of it as a continuum, well, you take the next level job, it's you're building on top of the knowledge and skills that you would have had as a supervisor. So the zone manager path presume that you had been through the supervisor path. So that begs the question, what do you do when we hire a zone manager from outside or from some other part of this Navy's civilian corps? Uh, you know, so what do we do with them? Well, actually you have to start them back off of the supervisor path and they need to learn that to be a zone manager. And then they got to get into the zone manager path. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. There's no shortcuts if you're going to be a zone manager. Now, if you're a zone manager and you've got good supervisors and they've been around for a while, then you don't need to worry about how to deal with people's timesheets and fixing that. You can allow the supervisors to do that and you can go focus your learning on things that are more critical to the zone manager job. But if you have a need for what the supervisors know so that you can manage them, you can monitor their work and troubleshoot their work, well, then that training for the supervisors is perhaps what you need to back up and take at some point and you got to figure out you know how important is that when would I need that can I defer that for a month or two or six or a year uh, you know and as always it depends it's got to be situational 
So we did the design meeting, produced the design. Everybody loved it. They loved the pass. They loved the modular content, training and development events made up of training and development lessons made up of training and development instructional activities. Information leading to demonstrations, sometimes, not always, and then applications, application exercises, where people got authentic practice with feedback so that they could hone a skill or memorize something that they needed to have at the ready and there was no time to look it up in the performance aid. But the path also included, here's a bundle of job aids and no training is necessary, but this is where we're gonna give them these job aids. Or we're gonna embed the job aids into some of the training courses, whether those are group-paced training courses or self-paced training courses or coached training courses or call it instruction or call it learning, call it whatever. Uh, we have a proliferation of labels that uh, are overlapping and sometimes they have nuanced meanings and differences and sometimes not. Then, the, so that's the third phase, the design phase, produce the path and then you take the path to, at the end of the design phase, to the project steering team gate review meeting and they get to kill the project because it doesn't make any sense anymore or defer the, the next phase or amend the project plan for going forward or approve it and resource it. Those are their choices. Then we go into the fourth phase, which is implementation planning. Now we've gotten a reaction from the project steering team and they may have said, you know, there's some things on this path here that, you know, <laughs> aren't worth a nickel for us to produce. Yeah, people need to know them, but you know what? They'll figure that out easily enough. They can ask anybody in the office where they work or whatever. We don't need to create formal content. Performance aids or job aids or in, in, instruction of any type. We'll leave that to what Guy has always called unstructured OJT unstructured on the job training where you'll just have to figure it out on your own somehow some way informal learning is what it's called nowadays or social learning is what it's called nowadays but that's unstructured OJT where the client says yeah that's a thing but uh, we don't want to invest in it we don't see the return for that project steering team is there to bring a business sense to instructional design just because an instructional designer can uncover a valid learning need does not by itself warrant meeting that need. That's been part of my philosophy since the very beginning here. I do not believe in overkill in the extreme with all sorts of instruction. There's too many things, as we all know, that we can learn easily enough on the job. And it's, it's always the low risk and uh, low reward kind of performance. The curriculum architecture design helps the client get a grasp on what the real need is and they can focus their investments on high stakes performance. High risk, high reward, two sides of the same coin in my view. Uh, we went to the fourth phase implementation planning where we said okay so we got approval, we got reactions from people, now let's meet with a group, and again, the project steering team handpicks who's gonna be involved in this, because they may not want anybody. I usually ask for somebody from the finance organization, because now we're gonna take and prioritize the gap content. Content that we don't have at all, or where we have content, but we can only use it after modification, so there's gonna be some expense associated with that. Let's figure out what the real priorities are, by a group of people that have been empowered by the project steering team to make those decisions on behalf of the organization. And of course, we're gonna be going to the project steering team with that view, and then they can change it if they feel it's necessary. But they've got to empower a group to do that. So we end up identifying what all the priorities are, and then we put a estimated cost to build or buy, or to buy and to fix and amend content to put it in place to make it real so we've got existing content on the path and we've got all these opportunities to spend money and so here are the priorities from all the gaps where we don't have exactly what we want here's the cost associated with that and we put that in a in a spreadsheet and so the client can go okay i have a budget of x and i can see how far down the list of priorities my budget's going to go now, it's been my experience that when I've gone in to read out the implementation plan draft to the project steering team, they've looked at 
the priority list, and this is where truth and titling becomes extremely important so they can get a pretty close idea as to what they're going to get if they put that content into place. And they can see the estimated costs that's based on real world experience locally. What does it cost to put in an eight hour course or a 20 page job aid or a two page job aid? You know, we've got to have some reasonable way to estimate all that. But they can look and see how far the priorities are going to be taken by the current budgeting. So my client who's got the budget is looking at this and going, hey, I've got a budget of X or no one's given me any budget. How far does the project steering team want to go? This, these are business decisions, not instructional design decisions. So it's important for the client to be able to look down the list and go, hey, I see where your budget's only going to take you to priority number 22 on the list. And <clears throat> darn it, but hey, uh, ladies and gentlemen on the project steering team, I don't think that's sufficient. We got to get down there into the 50s. If you look at what those titles are down there, we need to put all of that in place. And we neither either need to do it in the next budgeting cycle, in the next two or three years budgeting cycle. Again, it's a business decision. How long can you wait until you put this in place to help to build more effective and efficient performance competence? in these primary target audiences and so it's a huge challenge um, but it brings that client and so you want the project steering team to be involved and to review those decisions and to again kill it uh, put it on hold defer it amend it or resource it and when you're done with the curriculum architecture, you have no new content. All you know is what you're missing and what the priorities are and what it's going to cost to go forward priority by priority. Um, you're going to need them when you start building and buying content in the ADDIE level of my methodology, which is MCD. So you do a curriculum architecture design, and then that has a follow-on where you're either building uh, traditional kinds of training courses, maybe you're using webinars or something or e-learning. Um, but so you need to know about that. Uh, you, you need to have the focus on what are we going to get for our investments in uh, is our, our planned investment dollar amounts or whatever currency you're working in. Is that sufficient to our business need? Yes or no is the answer. Uh, I've had many of my clients who were awarded by doing one of these projects because their clients, the project steering team members, decided that their budget is totally inadequate for meeting the needs of the business as they saw it. And so the challenge usually becomes, all right, you guys who are going to live with the consequences of this, you better help the training organization get the resources it need because it doesn't have them, so it's not going to happen unless you guys make it happen. And I've had been in meetings where the project steering team members said, don't worry about it, I got the money in my budget to cover that. We're gonna go into the 50s here. Uh, and Guy, are you sure about these you know, estimates? And I say, it's, you know, every number is 20, plus or minus 25%, so there's a, a, a toler intolerance stack up, if you will, and most of them understand that. And so that's our best guess. And as we go forward, we'll track what the real numbers are, what the real data is, because either you had fairly good estimating numbers or you didn't and it's more of a wild ass guess if you will a wag or it's a but I like to tell them no it's not a wag it's a swag it's a scientifically based wild ass guess but let's be real about it it's an estimate and so plus or minus 25 percent is the weasel words that I always put on estimates like that because it's just our best guess and until we collect real data and sharpen our numbers our estimating numbers we really don't know but that was a very interesting project. Again, the Navy wasn't able to take that and do much with that. Uh, in fact, they gave that to the vendor that they always did work with. And that group took all of our modular content using different modes and media, and they built it all as instructor-led training because that was cheaper for the Navy to do to implement the whole darn thing. So what would have been a modular approach a little bit of instruction and practice, let people go out on the job and, and apply it and then come back for more training per their individual training and development plan, which takes a training and development path and down selects everything that they need because the rest of it they don't need. So don't put it as part of their plan and then resequence all of that and time it 
to meet the needs of the business. So the first thing we do is performance eyes instruction and then we personalize it based on the person's job assignment and their current existing knowledge and skills based on their education or work experiences. Anyway, a very interesting project. My client, uh, the people that I work most closely with and the, in the training organization uh, love the methodology. In fact, one of them uh, was tasked by the uh, CNO, the Chief Naval Officer, the top person in the United States Navy, to use that method, not CNO didn't know about the methodology, but ta tasked my uh, cohort there uh, wor uh, working with me on the project um, to create a new training and curriculum path for Six Sigma in the Navy. My, my friend uh, uh, reported back to me, he said the, he was in a meeting with the chief of the, uh, the CNO and the CNO said, isn't Six Sigma all about variability reduction? And yes, sir, was the response. And he said, then how come we've got eight different approaches of Six Sigma in my Navy? Art, you fix that. So Art Willoughby, my, one of my clients, the people that I work with closely on this, Jonathan White was another one. Uh, Art got the assignment to go ahead and tackle Six Sigma, Sigma across the United States Navy. And he used what he learned from me uh, about curriculum architecture design. He was, you know, well-versed in ADDI level analysis and design efforts, but the curriculum architecture thing is a little bit different. And he was able to observe me doing this project and then run off and go off and do that next project without me. And I've learned over the years that, you know, it often works like that. They don't need me after the first project. And that's a good thing. That means it's something that's not impossible. It's not unique to my background and capabilities. Uh, lots of people can pick this up. Of course, there have been failures also. Another interesting project, uh, and, and that one was my 73rd uh, curriculum architecture design project. I did a project with Eli Lilly, my 74th, and they had uh, clinical trials happening all over the world where you're testing out you know, the, the, the pharma products that a company like Eli Lilly produces. And they had done a Six Sigma project on the processes, trying to reduce variation in the process. And I think there was a little bit of lean going on in that too, where they were streamlining the process. This was globally, so it happened differently. And when you're operating globally, you have different equivalents of our FDA in the United States. The, uh, Food and Drug Administration, and they prescribe, you know, what quality means and how they're going to regulate how you do business. So every country's got one, and they're not all exactly alike, and so that was one of the issues that uh, Eli Lilly was contending with. But they took a look at all the training organization, who had been my client on many different projects previously, back when I was working with Ray Svensson and back at, at Caddy, and now here I, I, I am at Epic. And they need to, they took a look at the Six Sigma data and they realized this isn't granular or detailed enough for us to actually build training off of this. So they wanted to do a pilot test and have Guy come in. He'd already trained people at Eli Lilly on the, on the training staff in Indianapolis on how, on how to do this methodology, how to do the analysis, how to do the curriculum architecture design. But they wanted me to come and do this because it was kind of high stakes for them. So I took the process data, the process maps, and the other articulation of the process and used that uh, and met with a group of people and we reviewed all that. We detailed out all the micro tasks or mid-level tasks and the outputs within these processes because some of that was visible at a very high level but it wasn't detailed enough. So I did that and then we went into the design phase and designed a curriculum for a global audience. And so there were chunks of content that were good for everybody, anybody, everywhere, no matter where you are. There might be language issues and so you're gonna have to convert the, this content into the languages of the people that, that were on the payroll. But um, the goal was to find, okay, so what is it that can be shareable across all these geographies and what was the content that was unique to each geography? 
because you have to include that. You can't have people doing their task performance and not be aware of what the rules are, the rules imposed by a regulator who can either fine you, throw your executives in jail, or just shut your business down. <clears throat> and so it was uh, high stakes again for them, and clinical trials are important to uh, prove in the efficacy of uh, drug products and uh, you know so it's you know you have to make sure that the it's the the drug that you're going to be putting the through these clinical trials is handled appropriately you know was it refrigerated if that's necessary for it from the time it left where it was produced to where the clinical trial was you know there's all of these uh, complicated issues high stakes issues um, that needed to be attended to and so they were trying to make sure that they had more success in the clinical trial in in conducting clinical trials whether the drug was proved in or out was was of course their goal was to prove it in if it was worthy of that but you don't want to take a drug to market that actually doesn't work because then you got recalls and pr problems and all those kinds of things so it was an interesting project from that standpoint um the next project I like to talk about is, again, because of the work that I'd done at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, um, I was asked to work with a project that lasted about five months for me, but it was actually a couple years for the others that were on the project, for NAVC. And NAVC is a civilian group with Navy people embedded in there to make sure that the Navy gets what it wants. But it's a civilian group that's uh, supporting naval sea operations. Um, there's other groups that handle, you know, flight operations and things like that. But so that, you know, who, how do you support the ships at sea, uh, the nuclear submarines and the uh, tin can destroyers and the aircraft carriers and all of that? Um, so I would work five months on that project with my former business partner Ray Svensson, who the prime contractor on this was somebody that that had been a subcontractor with us back in the day and in fact had worked at our Prudhoe Bay uh, uh, qualification and, and certification projects that we had worked on and so this was somebody that we knew for a long time and had actually introduced us to other clients along the way and but anyway so he brought in Ray Svensson, he brought in me, he also brought in two people from the Performance Design Lab which was the uh, current organization then of Gary Rumler one of my key mentors, somebody that Ray Svensson had known for a long time. Um, and this is, uh, of course, before Geary passed away in 2008. But, so, but he had a couple of his people on this project as well. And so we worked on that project, and I was brought in to do a curriculum architecture design, but the project was in great turmoil. We had a client who seemed to like turmoil, and he, uh, even though the project was in, involved Six Sigma and lean kind of efforts were, you know, in Six Sigma you're trying to reduce variation of the process so you can reduce variation in the final products. Um, we had ver variation all over the place. Uh, it got to a point here where it was obvious I wasn't going to be doing, I'd been there for five months every day and I hadn't been given the opportunity to do the curriculum architecture that I was brought in to do. So eventually I left because it didn't seem appropriate for me to be on their payroll doing this kind of work here and doing all sorts of other things. Um, but anyway, so that was an interesting project because I got to work with Cherie Wilkins and uh, Kimberly Morell, who were part of Gary Rummler's organization. Uh, so a couple years later then, <clears throat> you know, here's a story where timing is everything. So I had a former client staff member who was becoming the leader of one of the training organizations at Wachovia Bank, which was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And whereas I started my business Epic in the suburbs of Chicago, in 2004 I had moved to North Carolina. And uh, I, she was, she and I were talking about something else and she said, hey, you know, I, I've got this, I'm taking over this job here, I'm not there yet. But uh, how would you like to come uh, and join me at Wachovia and become the director of curriculum architecture? You know, because she had seen the work that I had done at her 
organization, a couple of organizations earlier. She had been with the sales training organization for AT&T Network System, which was one of my big clients from 1986 to 94. So here it is. Uh, 14 years later, and or 13 years later, and we're talking about me joining her as she takes on this uh, executive position uh, with one of the bi the biggest training organization within Wachovia Bank. Again, timing is everything. So I joined in January of 2008, and uh, those of you who remember, that was when the uh, start of the Great Recession, and the banking system was under great stress, and Wells Fargo was asked or forced to take over Wachovia. And so I was there a year, but there was so much turmoil going on. Um, I had been told that I was going to be given 85 people to be part of my organization. We were going to take over doing all of the analysis and design at the curriculum architecture level and at the course development level. And there would be delivery people in all the customer groups. But uh, that was supposed to happen. But I was there eight months and had zero staff. So I did a lot of interviews and tried to understand who were all these people that I was supposedly going to get someday. And eight months later, the day came and I was given 85 people along with the charge to do an RIF, reduction in force. I had to lay off people. I had to go from 85 to 55 people the first day that I had been given 85 people. And then it wasn't too much lo longer weeks, uh, and I was asked to reduce again from 55 to about 35, and eventually I had to take the organization down to 10 people. Um, it was uh, not a fun job assignment. I was trying to see it through to the end, hoping that I would eventually be given the uh, charge to install curriculum architecture design and my MCD processes into an organization, but it became apparent that that just wasn't going to happen. So I left them in early 2010 and went back to consulting full time. I kept my business open. My accountants wanted me to keep my business open because I had book revenues and things like that. Um, and so I just went back to, to being a consultant, external consultant, instead of being an internal one that really didn't get anything done in the two years and three months that I was there. Not a fun time for anybody, and I feel bad for the people that I had to let go. I was happy to see that many of them actually landed back with uh, Wells Fargo then. Uh, others went to other financial institutions, a lot of banks. Um, but, you know, you got to roll with the punches, and that's what we all did. But um, the next uh, interesting consulting project I got was when I got a call from the folks at PDL, the Performance Design Lab, the organization of Gary Rumler. He'd already passed away, uh, but so this was his son, Rick Rumler, who I had met when I was at Motorola back in 1981. And Alan Ramis was one of the principals, uh, partners at uh, PDL. And Alan and I had worked at Motorola together for Bill Wiggenhorn back in the day. In fact, when I left Motorola in 82, Alan inherited most of my projects, uh, including those that I was working with Gary Rumler on. Um, and so he got really close to the Rumler methodology. And uh, when Gary started the uh, Rumler Brace organization with Alan Brace, Alan Ramis went with them and joined that organization. Um, but anyway, so Alan was now part of PDL's uh, uh, partner. He was one of the partners. And Cherie Wilkins was one of the other partners. And I had just worked with her at that NAVC project a few years earlier. Actually, it was a, almost a decade. And, uh, and what they were charged with is one of their clients wanted to create a series of self-paced training modules uh, kind of like Bob Mager's Criterion Referenced Instruction, CRI, which was a bunch of little booklets and things like that that systematically took you through developing your competence. And they had in, their client had envisioned this, and so they were building that about their own methodology. And I do curriculum architecture, and they needed to uh, uh, put an architectural spin on this whole thing. So I was involved in helping them do some of that. They'd already started, then they brought me in, and then I was developing some of these modules. Now, 
When I hired in with them to do this project, I had told them that I was waiting on a huge assignment, a project that was going to be 20, 24 months, 32 months, who knew, uh, up in Toronto, and I had already committed to doing that, so I was happy to help them out until that project came up. And in our world, we know that that often doesn't happen. It's a promise that never gets fulfilled. But anyway, so I got the opportunity to go to Toronto, and so I had to leave the PDL project. Uh, I left it in good hands with, with a couple other people, and then they carried on with it. But I don't think that they finished the entire set of modules that was intended. Um, but I went off to Toronto on a, what turned out to be a 20-month gig, and the, uh, the prime contractor who brought me in was one of my former uh, clients for curriculum architecture design at three different companies. So he liked the methodology. In fact, my first day after leaving Motorola, I met him in Houston, Texas at the NSPI uh, chapter meeting, which was my very first NSPI chapter meeting presentation that I did with Ray Svensson on doing job modeling using a group process. And uh, so this guy had brought me in and a bunch of other people and then I brought in another group of people and we were a team of consultants who was supposed to work with a team of internal people and our charge was to clean up their SOPs. And the reason they needed to do this that the uh, that, that this Canadian company had been shut down from doing business in the United States by the FDA who took exception to their SOP system. And when we got in there and took a look at it, there were at least five different versions of how they had formatted this content. They were inconsistent in terms of the depth that it went to. You know, was it just telling people what to do or was it telling people what to do and how to do it? And it was all over the map. And the FDA doesn't like that kind of thing. They like consistency. So the, the client group, uh, we worked for 20 months. Uh, we had a big false start in how we were doing things. The, the project steering team equivalent that was put together and overseeing the consultants and, and their own internal people's efforts, um, it charged us and bought into the thing that we were going to use a group process, bring people in, the top performers, take a look at the SOPs, project them and edit them live and facilitate this team of, of experts, master performers, and the people that were doing the word processing right in front of your very eyes as it was projected on the screen, and clean up these SOPs and set a standard and then follow that standard and do all that. Well, getting the right people out of the organization to do this work proved to be highly problematic. The executive signed off on it, but that didn't cascade down into anything meaningful that meant that it was a feasible approach. It was resisted at, at, at all quarters and uh, we ended up having to go a different route, which is to take the SOP documents and go to one or two or three people at a time and edit them that way. And which meant then you'd update it and you'd take it to another group to review it and they would have to get their thumbprints and fingerprints all over it and make their edits. A lot of times it was wordsmithing, uh, arbitrary changes from, you know, when you have to change the to the, you know, you're in trouble. Um, but so we ended up successfully uh, doing about three quarters of the SOPs that we, we needed to do that. We turned over and trained the internal people uh, of the group that would normally be doing this work, but they had their normal work to do. And so this was a huge project and that's why they had brought us in, but we successfully transferred that in there. We had trained them how to do this using the methodology that we had finally put together. Uh, after we left, they didn't follow that methodology. They went into the ditch, they got pulled out of the ditch, and then they started following our methodology and they had great success with that. But um, it was one of those projects where the handoffs between us and the client group could have been better handled. But there was a lot going on in the organization and management did not insist that they follow that methodology, um, and that would have been helped, been helped if those people from the group that was going to inherit the methods had been involved with us earlier and seen the logic and the false starts and all of that. But no, it was kind of a blind handoff where you throw 
as they say, the product over the transom, the wall, and the other people see it land and they pick it up and they don't know exactly what to do with it. And uh, so it's not one of those good examples. It's one of those non-examples. Something I learned long ago is that you shouldn't call anything a bad example. It was a bad example. Um, another interesting project that I was involved with just prior to starting that Toronto project for 20 months was with a group in Atlanta, a healthcare company, and they had a role called a healthcare representative. And these people would go into the hospitals and deal with people who weren't going to be able to pay their hospital bills and counsel them on what the various social services agencies at the local community level, at the state level, and at the federal level could help them pay the hospital. So the hospitals were interested in this because they were going to get paid or they weren't going to get paid. And so this group went in there and counseled um, indigents, people who couldn't afford their hospital care, but the hospitals had to serve them anyway. And so can the hospital recover the money somehow, some way? And there's lots of programs for doing that. But anyway, so this job had a tremendous amount of turnover because the people were trained on a bunch of topics and not on tasks. So I was brought in as a subcontractor to the prime contractor who wanted to see how this methodology really worked. And so I did the project. And I ran the analysis team meeting and documented all of that and sent that off for review and then came back a week or two later and did the design team meeting with a group of master performers from the field, the best of the best, and also a bunch of the training folks who weren't too happy about having their current configuration of content messed with by somebody who didn't know what they were doing. So there was a, it was challenging in that respect, but they eventually bought into the whole thing. And this was the group that was going to inherit my three levels of design, events comprised of lessons, comprised of instructional activities, and they had to go build the thing out. So it was good that they were involved in both the analysis and design because then they were able to see and help us with, so what existing content can we really use as is? And the majority of it was we could use it after modification, major modifications, and there was a fair amount of things that were totally not touched by the current curriculum, and now they could see the logic in the whole thing. They could see the logic of the training development path, an idealized sequence, continuum of learning, and that made sense to them, but they built that out. And a uh, funny story about that is that, uh, let's see, so that was in 2013, and then I was brought in in 2018 by the same company that had been acquired, so there was a name change, to do a curriculum architecture design on their sales organization. So this is a new project. This is, pro this is my curriculum architecture number 76. It's the last one that I did back in 2018. And I'm on the very first call, and the guy that hired me into this project, he wasn't on the call yet, but, but the key person dealing with what was going to be the project steering team equivalent, she was on the call. And she was saying, oh, Guy, it's so great to, to finally get to meet you, even though we're doing this on a conference call. And uh, we want to thank you so much for that work that you did previously. And we won that award, and that was just so cool. And I said, you won an award? And she said, what, you don't know about that? And I go, what are we talking about here? And she said, well, that work you did on the healthcare representative, we won an ATD award for that work. And... Uh, Heck, your name was in the uh, submission documents and all of that. And I said, oh, really? Uh, Pete didn't tell me about that. <laughs> and so when Pete got on the phone call, she razzed him because he, he said, Guy, I thought I had told you about it. I am so sorry. Let me send you the documentation. I'll even send you a picture of us standing on the stage winning the award. And uh, I, I guess you should have been there with us here. I'm sorry about that, man. Anyway, so those things are okay. In fact, you know, I could have given them a perfect design, which I'm sure I didn't, and they could have screwed it up. But what they did is they took the design and they built some really great training that got results. Um, that really, it reduced their turnover significantly. The people were more proficient, uh, an acceptable level of performance proficiency, 
much sooner than they'd ever experienced so it was a huge win which is really why I got brought in to do the next project which was uh, for the sales organization for sales reps and I was told that okay we've been doing a lot of mergers this new company um, and that there's seven different sales groups and we need to get them all on the same page they're all approaching sales differently and the organization is going to streamline all of this and everybody's gonna do sales the same way we're gonna go for team-based selling blah 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 a whole bunch of things like that and I said okay cool seven different groups here I've been there and done that before where there's seven sets of curricula seven different ways of doing things when we've got to come up with one now my client fought really hard for me to be able to do this via the facilitated group process where we assembled teams of master performers, subject matter experts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, but that wasn't going to fly. The sales leadership wasn't going to buy that. And they were busy getting ready for an IPO and so their attention was elsewhere, but they needed to put the, have this put in place. Well, I'm conducting everything then through telephone calls from my home office calling people all over the country um, and in Canada uh, that are part of the sales organization and come to find out that these seven current groups of sales folks really represented 28 different merged organizations that were configured into seven and so there weren't seven different ways of doing things there was 28 and of course anybody that knows anything about this kind of thing knows that 28 is just the tip of the iceberg because within any one of those 28 people were doing things in a varied approach and so that was the challenge so we standardize on a sales process from beginning to end if you will from you know getting a, a lead or or digging up your own lead to at the very end making a sale and then watching the implementation to make sure that your customer was taken care of because you as a salesperson most good salespeople know that they are advocates for their customer they have to go do battle inside their own darn company to get the customers needs met and to expedite any problems or issues that may arise if they want to have the next sale so in order to get future sales this is not a transactional approach to sales this is win-win sales we want to make sure the customers needs are bad we need to fix any problems that arise so that we can get the next sale um, which is just you know a good practice a standard practice but anyway so that was a very interesting project and that was my last project before I took the year 2019 off to have two knees replaced my uh, left knee is coming up on its one year anniversary I'm 67 that knee is one year old and in July we'll be celebrating the uh, the one year anniversary or the one year birthday of the right knee um, doing much better um, happy that I did that I spent seven years with intermittent pain and that last year when I was doing that last curriculum architecture design project I was pretty much in constant pain every step I took except when I went to the four-day meeting in Atlanta and had to stand up on my feet and facilitate for four days my knees somehow both decided to cooperate it's amazing how that works and then on the drive back home <clears throat> it was bad anyway so that's that's those are some of the more interesting projects that I've had uh, since I started epic in 2002 uh, I've been doing a lot of presentations. Uh, I've, I've got a bunch of pages here, but I did things for the ISPI chapter in the Bay Area of, Cal of San Francisco. I did AT&T, uh, the Buffalo Niagara Falls chapter. I've presented to the World Bank and the training organization there. I've spoken to the students at Concordia University in Montreal. Um, I've spoken at uh, the ASTD uh, Charlotte chapter for their Day of Learning. Uh, the Michigan chapter of ISPI, the Chicago chapter of ISPI, I won't read all the titles. They're all about curriculum architecture design, doing performance modeling, and systematically deriving the knowledge and skill enablers, or it's about my training and development systems view book that came out uh, after I started Epic. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, an ASTD forum, a you know, uh, 60 minute forum for them. I uh, did things for the American Society for Quality and did a webinar uh, for them back in 2012. Um, 
and I've just done a lot of these things with the uh, ISPRA Armed Forces chapter. Uh, I had an interesting project to come and go and speak to um, the NSA and I won't disclose where the site is because I'm not sure if that's supposed to be a secret or not. I don't think it is. But these are the cryptologists who are, you know, decoding uh, secret messages, if you will. And uh, their issue was that they brought in people from the various branches of the service who had all had the same job but were taught differently. And their issue was for people that we kept bringing new, what's that set of curricula look like? And now how do we account for the variances across the various branches of the military for people who are going to join the NSA to do that. And it was very interesting. I got to speak to, uh, there was a room of, I don't know, 40-some people in it. There were a few admirals and there were a few uh, Blue Jackets like I was. I was able to do a shout out to the Blue Jackets, which simply means that you were in the Navy, but you were not brown shoes, you were black shoes enlisted. So I was an enlisted serviceman in, in the Navy, and uh, so I was able to do a shout out, and they were able to shout back at me. But, I was, uh, but anyway, so I, uh, interesting thing, after I was done with that project, the client gave me a little pen set with not a pencil next to the pen, but with a letter opener. And it's got the NSA logo on it and insignia, and it's really kind of cool. And I've often thought that I wonder how many people have found it necessary to use that letter opener as a knife in case they were really in trouble. That was, that was just my fantasy from having done that project. But that was pretty cool, entering a building that didn't have any names on it, armed guards everywhere. Um, I had, we had to leave my phone and all the electronics in the car in the parking lot, couldn't take anything into the building top secret stuff but a very interesting thing and I was happy to support them and do that you know for free because I was in the military I understand those things um, I've spoken at the ISP Hampton Roads chapter the Kansas City chapter the Tampa chapter I'm going through this quickly um, um, Orlando if I hadn't said that already and an, another interesting presentation I did was with the Hanshaw, Hanshaw organization. They, they used to do an e-learning conference every year. And this was in Charlotte in 2008. And I met the owner, Dick Hanshaw. And he and I started talking uh, after I'd given my session and we went to have get some food. And we started talking about ISPI. And he had told me that, you know, he had started up a couple of ISPI chapters in his previous 20, 30 years. And uh, our closest chapter was in Raleigh, so it's a two, three hour or more drive, depending on the traffic, away. And shouldn't we start a Charlotte chapter? So he and I did. We were co-founders of the Charlotte chapter of ISPI, which is still running. Uh, we did that. We worked on it in 2008, launched it in 2009. We invited our buddy. Uh, Civil Asylum Tiagarajan, you may know him as Tiagi, we invited him to the inaugural meeting to kick it off with an evening program and a one-day workshop the next day. And we had Judy Hale come in the next month, or uh, two months later, we were doing things every other month back then. They've changed that uh, uh, model and timing a little bit uh, since then. But um, I'm very, uh, you know, I was very happy to have done that. And uh, my goal has always been to see if I could help people get the same kind of experience that I had when I first got into the business. Um, I got that from the Detroit chapter of NSPI back in the day, and that was MSIT, the Michigan Society for Instructional Technology. That's back in the day when we were all instructional technologists, but then that group that used to be known as MIS, Management Information Systems, they changed their name to Information Technology. And, and we got the boot. And uh, so we couldn't call ourselves ITers anymore, instructional technologists. We had to find a new name, and that's really kind of where ISD or ID kind of comes from back then in the late 70s or early 80s. Um, <clears throat> but um, um, that's my little story about that. Um, I've spoken on the uh, employee performance-based qualification and certification systems and performance tests. And uh, once Ray Svensson and I wrote that book uh, back in 2007 based on the work that we had done in Prudhoe Bay 
um, in 87 and then on the Alaska pipeline in 94 and we took everything that we had learned from that and all that experience and we had done this with other clients after that with uh, sales organizations an entire branch uh, organization which is now Siemens Building Technologies but with a couple of other our, our other clients we helped them build performance tests and qualification tests uh, instead of just relying on knowledge tests so we really believe that the proof in the pudding is in at the performance level and not just what people know people may know things and still not able to do it you may know how to make a good weld but you can't make a good weld or you may know what the proper steps are for the sales call but you can't do it um, and that's what performance-based training is all about and performance tests prove or measure people's performance competence at the end of instruction or after the end of instruction and some time out on the job. There's many ways to implement those kinds of things. Um, I, I had a three years in a row where I co-facilitated uh, a session at the ISBI chapter with that civil asylum guy, that uh, Tiago Rajan guy, that guy that uh, many know as Tiagi. Um, I used to go in and sit in the front row of his sessions at ISPI, and he would always make fun of me because that's just kind of the kind of guy he is. And I would, you know, try to give it back to him. And eventually, and he would, he would, he would talk about how he and Matt Richter they'd be building the, you know, building the airplane while they're flying it. And then he would point to me and say, "Guy does this the totally opposite way." And, uh, you know, he's got to do everything up front and, you know, the old traditional way. So he'd make fun of me. And at one session, he said at the end of it, in front of everybody in the room, Guy, why don't you present with me next year? I'll do my approach and you do your approach and we'll let the audience decide. And I said, sure, okay. And we actually did that. So we did that uh, the first year, I believe it was in 2007. Um, Actually, that may have been the that was the third year, and uh, but in but we did it in 2006. We did it in 2005. So, in 2006, a good friend, Rich Perlstein, was was in the audience, and he heard the banter back and forth. Yagi's presenting on how he does things, and I'm presenting on how I did things. And Rich made this comment at the end, and I, I think it's kind of true. At least he says, you know, Tiagi makes this sound so easy, but it's not. Guy makes this thing sound so hard, but it's not. And so Tiagi said, okay, Rich, next year you come and present with us. And so Rich joined us for that third year in 2007 at the uh, ISBI conference in San Francisco. Anyway, Tiagi is one of my favorite people. Um, I always learn something when I, uh, uh, you know, attended one of his sessions or I read anything that he writes. Um, you know, he likes to have fun. He, he takes the work, the performance seriously, but the rest of it he does not. And uh, if we can make engaging content that focuses on performance, we know people will have fun. But uh, I've heard him say that, you know, it's not all about the fun, it's really about the engagement in something that's authentic. Performance-based training content is how I would say it, that's not how he says it. But the other thing that I always learned from him is that he used to say this, and I don't think he says this quite this way anymore, but he used to say, all learning happens in the debriefing. I try to do my best Indian uh, accent on this, but I can't. So, um, But he would say that all learning happens in the debriefing. And I've always tried to build in those periods of reflection at the end of a lesson in my design configuration. But at the end of every lesson, after you've been through the information demonstration and application exercises, and a bunch of them are just, you know, a few, um, we need to pause. And so I always have a lesson open and close. And in the close is where we talk about what we covered, we reflect on that, we talk about, I think, what Will Tallheimer calls action planning. So now that you've learned this, what are you going to do about it? So. Um, I've been doing that kind of an approach for a long time based on what I learned from Tiagi back in the 80s to make sure that we paused long enough to reflect on what it is we've learned, how did that again tie to the prior knowledge that theoretically many people, all of them should have had, 
where does this lead to downstream in the learning? What's the next lesson or the next lessons? And where are we going to use what we just learned? And so how are we going to then take this back to the job and apply it? And what barriers are we going to uh, con be confronted with? And how are we going to overcome that and talk about that? And maybe perhaps even share that one participant to the next about the barriers that they perceive that they're going to have to deal with and get the group to chime in on strategies and tactics. Now, these are often the things that clients don't like. They just want you to get on to the next lesson. They don't necessarily understand the importance of reflection as a way to help really instill the learning and to help with post-instruction, post-training, post-learning transfer. Because if it's not going to transfer, then why did you do any of this in the first place? To me, it's really critical. And if that's what's necessary to positively affect post-training transfer, then you got to do what you got to do to make that happen. Otherwise, the whole thing was a total waste of resources and time and effort. And that ain't no good, as we like to say. Um, I've also did a whole bunch of, besides all these presentations that I had page after page, um, I did a lot of presentations and so I'm going to share a few interesting things here. So I was elected to be president of ISPI back at the end of 2002 and I took over in to be president-elect for the year 2003, April to April. So, and then in 2003 in April I became the president of ISPI. I'd served as president-elect under Jim Hill, who was the president. Um, and so the, the cool thing about being president for a year in that professional society is that the conference is mine. I got to pick the keynote speakers. And uh, I was trying to save some money, but I knew who I really wanted to bring in. I wanted to bring in that guy, Neil Rackham of Spin Selling Fame, who I'd worked with back in 81 and 82 at Motorola. I'd helped Neil secure two clients of his, my client AT&T Network Systems that I'd worked with from 86 to 94. I was instrumental in bringing him in. He got a big spin selling contract to train all the salespeople in spin. I had brought him in hoping that we would get his win-win negotiations training for the product managers who needed that kind of training, but that didn't happen. So the negotiation stuff didn't happen, but the sales thing did. And then I also introduced him to my client at what's now Seaman Building Technologies, and it was when he started working with them. And uh, I introduced my client, uh, George West, to Neil Rackham, and Neil met with him, and all of a sudden that organization was doing the spin selling thing. Um, so Neil was, you know, always appreciative of that to me. So when I reached out to him in 2004 and said, Neil, I would, you know, I was wondering if you'd be available to do a keynote speech on this particular day in April of 2004, you know, is your calendar, are you even available? And he said, oh yeah, he would, and he'd be happy to do that. I said, well, there, I, I see that uh, your speaking fees are, you know, and I don't even know if this is current, but, you know, it says $18,000. And he said, oh, I'll waive that for you, guy. Uh, I said, oh, so so what do we have to do? And he said, well, just get me a first-class airplane ticket to Tampa and uh, put me up in nice accommodations and, you know, I'll, I'll do it for free. So I saved SPI twenty-some thousand dollars because that's about the amount of money that was spent on keynote speakers. That was pretty much standard for the kind of person that you brought in. And I had a second keynote speaker, a colleague that I'd worked for when uh, uh, Joe Sainer, who was a Baldridge examiner, an executive in the quality world at Baxter and at other places. Um, and he had worked with us for a year back in 94 to 95 with Ray Svensson and myself and, and my ex-wife. But uh, I had Joe come in to talk about quality and to talk about the Baldridge Award. To me, uh, too many of us didn't know back then when there was, Baldridge was a bigger deal and it's less so now and that's a shame. But it provided a model for how to look at uh, achieving organizational excellence or whatever you want to call it. It's got a bunch of different names, but you know, so what did the Baldrige people look at? 
And so if you knew how they would assess you, you could get ahead of that and go make sure that, you know, you could pass, put together your submissions and then um, get good marks in the Baldrige examination and hopefully go for the award. Um, and the going for the award was a very expensive process and that was part of Joe's message. But uh, you could use the model and the assessment documents and the submission requirements to take a look and assess your own organization and then start fixing things, uh, formalizing informal processes, uh, streamlining some of your processes, uh, reducing variation in your processes, you know, all the good quality stuff, and then attending to, you know, so what, how are you training and developing your people for that? So this is where, you know, instructional design kind of intersected with that. And of course, in my model, the Baldridge, Six Sigma, Lean, those kinds of things are all subset of the broadest view possible of human performance technology. Um, human performance technology is really, I, w I wish it were, this is my view, the, the umbrella for all things performance wise. And I would, and you know, there's, it was controversy as to whether you leave the word human as a preface to that phrase or not. And as the late Don Toasty often said, all performance is a human endeavor, you know, so why would we take that off? Now, maybe we would want to take it off because people think it's really all about HR kind of stuff or just dealing with the human variable in the process, and that's not the case. Uh, the work of Geary Rumler involved lean and Six Sigma kind of things, more lean than not, after he kind of left the instructional thing because he and many others in NSBI back in the 60s realized that you could provide the perfect instruction to people and that necessarily wasn't enough to change performance uh, at the organizational level, at the process level, at the enterprise level. And so more was needed beyond just training people. Um, so those are the people that were involved in the education revolution and several of those people like Geary uh, went beyond the educational revolution and went to I guess what Deming might have called, you know, the systems re-engineering uh, revolution and how to go affect organizational performance through more means and simply people and their knowledge and skills. Anyway, that's a little soapbox. I think I'm done with that. Yeah, I'm sure you're happy about that. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so I wrote a whole bunch of articles. I won't go through uh, doing that. That's all on my website. There's a uh, in the part of the menu is uh, publications and presentations and you can go look at that kind of thing here but one of the things that I did uh, back in 2010 and I eventually finished this off in 2011 was I took many of the books that I'd written including the quality roadmap from 94 lean ISD from 99 T&D systems view from 2001 Management Areas of Performance from 2004 that wasn't actually published until 2007 because I was waiting on the forward from my good buddy Joe Sainer, who I just told you about, because he had made the comment, Guy, this book addresses everything that the Baldridge Award is all about. And so anybody going after the Baldridge Award should read your book. Well, he changed jobs or yeah, within Baxter, and he lost all of his files. <clears throat> and it wasn't until years later that somebody called him up and said, hey, I found all these old files of yours in the, on the company intranet. Would you be interested in them? And so he went digging through that stuff and found the forward that he had been looking for but couldn't find for me. Um, and so then I finally published the book once I got his forward. But, uh, but anyway, so I took this collection of books and I, the first thing I did was made everything that I could available for free as a PDF. So there's lots of that stuff on my website. You can get the PDF there if you want to go that route and get the older versions, if you will, of this. But my intent was to take all that content and to reconfigure it into what became, uh, nobody calls it this but me, the Wallace six-pack, you know, kind of borrowing on the Mager six-pack. Um, but anyway, so I had my own six-pack of books, and they, they were, are titled The Curriculum Manager's Handbook, the original title of my Lean ISD book, but here it was focused on a manager in an ISD shop, and so what is it that they need to make sure put in place, look at all the systems and processes that they have. And then the second book was Performance Competence Analysis, meant for analysts who weren't 
managers of a department but needed to know how to do the analysis thing or wanted to learn my methodology for analysis. The third book was intended for curriculum architecture designers. The fourth book was for MCD designers, which is my ADDIE level. And those methodologies are different and the projects are a little bit different. So I wanted a book for those designers so the analyst could learn how to do that analysis thing and then it's just a matter of scope. Are you looking at the whole job, the whole process, the whole function, the whole department? If so, then that lends itself to curriculum architecture design. But if you have a task set to produce one output, um, you know, contract negotiations where we have a final uh, contract at the end of this thing, that's narrower than a whole job. So that's an MCD level effort. And you know, how do you design for that? Um, anyway, so those were the first four books. And then the next book is really a uh, re-articulation of my management areas of performance which says how do you go look at the performance of a department now Ray Svensson and my ex-wife uh, Karen and I back in the 1990 time frame we had done over 20 management analyses for instructional purposes at that point from the early 80s to 90 and we sat in a conference room for about a whole week and went through all of the data that we had and we came up with a master model, if you will, for how do you look at a manager's realm, their area of responsibility, and figure that out. And so Ray had work from when he was at AT&T that was similar to this thing, so we had a kind of a framework that we were going to go after. I subsequently changed the framework and the language on that a little bit because it, I felt it fit my needs for curriculum architecture work for managers um, better. And so I had my own uh, derivative, if you will, of that model, but I've used that uh, and I'm going to guess about a dozen management curriculum architecture design projects. Um, I did that at the Norfolk Naval Shipyard. That was the framework we used to systematically define, you know, what are all the chunks of the job, you know, end to end covering the whole thing here so that nothing is missing. Um, but anyway, so that was the fifth book in the series. And then the final book was a, a book where I wanted to say, if you're an analyst and a project planner manager type, then this sixth book is for you. And it's about how to, and, and if you're the curriculum manager, the manager of an ISD, ID shop, learning and development shop, whatever you want to call it, and you want to move to performance consulting, how do you get there? Well, the first thing is if you're doing training or instruction or learning, and it's not performance-based, you need to make that first step to become a performance-orientated uh, instructional design shop training, learning. And once you're there, then you can move more easily, segue to looking beyond instruction, beyond training, beyond learning, and begin to help your client address all the variables. Maybe the process isn't designed appropriately. Maybe there's too much variation in it. Maybe there is no process. Maybe it's, you know, I, people used to joke with me, you want to know about the process, okay, guy. Uh, are you talking about the Tuesday process or the Wednesday process? Because today's Wednesday and yesterday we did it differently and we're going to do it different today and we're going to do it different tomorrow, next week and on and on and on because that's just how we do things around here. So there was no stable standard process. And so how, you know, so I learned from Gary Rumler, the first thing you look at is the process itself. Is it, has it been designed to produce products where the process and the products met the stakeholder requirements? Is that even there? Because if it's not, there's no sense worrying about the training that might be required. You got to get the process fixed first. And then you can begin to look at are all the enabling assets, the human assets and the environmental assets, are they all in place well enough uh, to in, in, enable the process? Or are there shortfalls, shortcomings? gaps in those. Do people have the right data? Is it on time? Do they have the right tools? You know, are their saws sharp enough? Do the people have the knowledge and skills? Do they have the physical requirements? Do they have the psychological requirements? Do they have the intellectual requirements? Do they have the 
personal values that are conducive to what the process requires. The process doesn't care whether or not you have issues with people of color or different nationalities. The process doesn't give a damn, quite frankly. And so maybe you shouldn't be putting people who have those kinds of issues into a performance context where they got to deal with that. That just doesn't fit. Round peg in the square hole, get it right. And so the often we need to change our recruiting and selection criteria so that we get the right people in the first place and then we can train them on what they need to do. In fact, we can avoid a lot of training if we simply changed our hiring criteria, but it may be that the markets where you're operating don't have enough people with the incoming knowledge and skills that you really need, and so you're going to have to build them yourself. It's situational. You're going to have to take a look at every situation. You know, you can generalize this stuff, but then when you go into the real world, you got to get real, you got to get specific about all that kind of stuff. So those are the books. I wrote another book that I also published in 2011. Um, I'm really happy about that book because I asked uh, one of my later mentors in my career, Richard E. Clark, uh, with a doctorate in education, uh, <clears throat> Dick Clark, who seems to like me and uh, wrote a really nice LinkedIn review for me and the kind of work that I was doing. I didn't even know he was paying attention to what I was doing. But um, I asked him if he would review my book and give me some feedback, and if he was so inclined, would he write the foreword to this? And my book is on the fifth management foci. So it's, 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 it's when you have more than one focus. You've got foci. And uh, so the fifth one is how to keep foo-foo out of the other focus says that you must have. So what are these other focuses? And, uh, but how do you keep evidence-based practices central to what you're doing so that you're not embracing learning styles or some other set of nonsense um, that have no validity? And so managers need to make sure that they put the right system in place, but there's a lot of myths um, there's a lot of what, what he would call snake oil, what I was calling foo-foo. Um, you know, how do you avoid that? And managers need guidance on that. And so uh, that was my book, and he wrote a really great review of it. Um, the book has not been a big seller. I've probably not marketed it well. I've self-published these things so that I own the content and can update it whenever I want, which was an issue with some of the books that, uh, for example, when Ray Svensson wrote his book on uh, strategic planning for the training and development function, uh, he couldn't update that book because the publisher owned that content. In fact, it was always dicey with us in terms of when he goes out and makes presentations and refers to all the models that we've been using as a consulting organization for a long time, who really owned that? And, uh, you know, he wanted to update that book at one point and he couldn't because the publisher didn't really want to. So, so I, when I started uh, writing books after the first one, the Quality Roadmap book, I decided I was going to go the self-publishing route and uh, uh, a good friend, um, um, Jim Russell from Purdue, who taught instructional technology, uh, volunteered to be my editor for my first three books. Um, and I thank him greatly for that because he gave me even more confidence that what I wrote was on the right track and was consistent with the research. You know, I'm not a researcher. I can't cite the research. I know in general what the research says because I've been exposed to enough good people um, at NSPI, then ISPI, and a couple of other places. But, you know, the networks that we are, our professional networks, you've got to ask yourself this key question. Are those people helping you to average up or are they helping to average you down? Because they're promoting snake oil, foo-foo, myths. And so you got to be careful about the kind of, you know, your mother told you, you know, be careful who your friends are. Well, the same thing applies in adult life. Be careful who's in your professional network and who you're listening to and taking guidance from. And I've been darn lucky uh, in my professional career that I've been exposed to so many great people. Um, one thing that I was asked to publish, to write up, 
was a, uh, a remembrance of Joe Harless, who passed away in, um, I believe it was October 2012. And so I scrambled to reach out to a lot of the people that I knew in NSPI, ISPI that uh, knew Joe, people like Bob Mager, um, and, and lots of other people. And, uh, but I reached out to them and because I knew that Joe was a really was really close with Bob Mager. They were very competitive, writing fiction books, you know, later on in their lives, um, and claiming to have better fiction books than the other ones. And uh, but but I but I learned that Joe Harless and Bob Mager talked about once a month. And so when Joe passed away, I reached out to Bob and I said, Bob, I'd like you to write something here. I've been asked to pull something together and I want you to go first. I want your commentary to go first in this and mine will go last in this article. And I, I think I reached out to 15, 20 people and I took everything that they got and put a little article together for ISPI's uh, Performance Improvement Journal, PIJ as we call it, and uh, in memory of Joe. Uh, Joe was a character. Uh, uh, some people equated him to a Southern preacher. He used to call me Brother Guy or Brother Wallace, and I'd call him Brother Harless or Brother Joe, and uh, I had occasion to visit him twice to do sit-down videos with him for this HPT video series that I did, and I asked him if he would do the very first one for me and kind of help me create a model for what these things were like, and I went back in the next year in 2009 and did the same short version video, and then I had a longer sit-down with him uh, and we probed some of the things he was up to and the work that he was on. And uh, he gave his last presentation for ISPI's 50th annual conference in 2012 in Toronto. And I had asked him, I'd asked his permission to videotape his session. He was coming out of retirement. He hadn't been to the conferences in quite a while. And uh, would he be okay if I videotaped it and captured it for posterior and posted it to YouTube and he said yes and I happened to bump into him at the airport in Toronto as we were coming into town and so he said uh, you want to ride with me to the airport and I go if you're paying <laughs> yeah, those who know Joe <laughs> know that was quite bold of me because he would have minimally normally one and of course he wasn't like this at all it was just the fun we had with each other yeah, he said sure, and uh, so we rode in the uh, limo together from the airport uh, to the uh, hotel, and I uh, had an interesting conversation with him, and he was always one of my heroes, and uh, even though I approached this whole notion of uh, curriculum architecture design differently than he did his curriculum uh, methodologies, and I don't know his in great depth, I had taken a look at it a long, long time ago, but I know that you know we were both oriented on performance, and if you have your eye on that ball, on the terminal performance requirements, you know that that fixes a lot of things. Uh, you know you can't go wrong if that's really what your focus is. If that's what you're teaching people to do, and that's how you're assessing their capabilities when all is said and done, and or later after they've been back out at work for a while. Um, uh, you know it's all good and he never gave me a hard time about my own methodologies which didn't use his language uh, but uh, but I learned a lot from him over the years I learned a lot from him just as I had learned from Rumler and Gilbert's approach to guidance that, that Joe Harless called job aids that uh, Gloria Geary called electronic performance support systems when it's embedded in the tools or the equipment usually in the software uh, later on, it's called quick reference guides and performance support and workflow learning. Even though what Rumler and Gilbert wrote about in September of 1970 in their newsletter, that what to do doesn't have to be fixed in people's heads. It can be on paper. This was 1970. And, you know, so we can put this stuff on paper, laminate it or not, or whatever, put it in a booklet. And that provides the guidance that people need. They don't have to actually learn it. They don't have to memorize it. They don't have to pass a knowledge test after the fact. They just need to be able to demonstrate that with this job aid in hand, 
or on a tape recorder on your belt that's telling you step by step what to do because that was one of the examples they used in this newsletter article um, today we've got our smartphones or our tablets etc or it can be built in elsewhere into the system into the workflow um, this is all old school stuff and the only thing that's changed as a general commentary since i entered the business in 1979 good instruction good training good learning have key attributes and and so that's stood the test of time that whatever somebody learned back in the 70s and 80s from those kinds of folks the the rumblers and the harlesses and the makers that's still applicable today the only thing that's changed here is the technology we have to use to capture stuff and to deploy it that's all so now we can take advantages of the affordances or the utilities of the technology and use that to our advantage if it's conducive to the performance context. You can't expect me to read my smartphone uh, and download something to my smartphone if I'm in a manhole 40 feet under the ground and I got no signal. So you've got to understand the performance context before you can decide to how do we actually deploy this and or is it something that needs to be committed to memory and then how are we going to combat the forgetting curve which I like to say is steeper than the learning curve uh, people could take exception to that if they wish um, another thing that I wrote I think of interest is that uh, back in 2011 Jane Bozarth reached out to me and said guy you're writing a lot about the learning style stuff but would you care to write something for e-learning magazine she was one of the editors then and uh, I said oh sure so I reached out to the usual suspects in my professional network and said, you know, what do you guys think about this? So I reached out to Richard Clark, Richard Perlstein, Harold Stolovich, uh, Allison Reset, and a handful of other people, and they all gave their commentary about this learning styles thing, which I'd known was bogus going back into the 80s, but it's like a zombie that you can't kill, even if you have a silver bullet or it's daylight out, uh, they seem to have become robust to all of that and we can't seem to kill some of these myths. Uh, nowadays people like Will Tallheimer and Clark Quinn and many many others quite frankly are helping to address and helping the entire profession learn and avoid these myths but there's too many dollars involved and so unscrupulous marketeers and product companies and people in the learning and development space are promoting this stuff and sometimes our own professional organizations are promoting it or they're doing worse they're talking they're they're writing up and publishing how it's bad and then also how it's good lending confusion into the marketplace and many of us wish they would just stop that nonsense um, I'll, I'll begin to wrap up here and talk about um, the last thing I wanted to have on my list here is that back in 2010 I started a cartoon strip <clears throat> and uh, it ended in 2003 when that free online cartoon strip tool just disappeared and I hate when that happens um, it's like me posting a bunch of videos on uh, Google video and then them going out of business and then because they've gotten YouTube but YouTube limited you to 15 minutes and most of my videos were longer than that so then I went to blip TV then they changed their business model and then I moved everything over to YouTube because finally they had said whatever length is, is okay so I hate when that happens but that's one of the issues we have with all these tools is that you know what can we trust to be there for the long term especially if we put a tremendous amount of investment into building content and using that as a way to archive and deploy that content or make it accessible. But anyway, so I created this cartoon strip and the name of the cartoon strip was Lessons in Making Lemonade. And those of you who've heard that old saw, you know, what do you do when life hands you lesson, uh, lemons? You, you make lemonade, right? Turn a negative into a positive. Well, so this was a story of about a bunch of students and their teachers in some unnamed college town, River City of course, 
inside joke. Maybe some of you appreciate what that means. So uh, we got problems in River City uh, to be more suggestive about that. But there, these students are in an ISD program slash PI for performance improvement. They're learning all that good stuff. And so they're climbing the learning curve through a formal education process where they're, and, and the lemonade thing comes in is that Buzz, the main character, he's the manager of the on-campus lemonade stand. And Jimmy, who works behind the counter as well, they serve all these students who are in their same program and their professors. And there's also the, the guy that uh, represents the health department and he's in charge of uh, regulations and things like that. So he's always poking his nose into the lemonade stand business, making sure that they're adhering to stakeholder requirements other than the customer requirements. So I did 1151 cartoon strips over a three and a half year period. This is all still online. It's a WordPress site. Um, so if you want to find this and go look at it, lessons in making lemonade. Um, and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Here we are in April of 2020 and the entire planet is dealing with a pandemic, uh, the coronavirus. And it's a challenging time for many. Um, and so this series of videos I put together uh, for those who have a lot of free time now because their consulting engagement, their projects, have kind of disappeared or evaporated on them or gone on hold. Um, maybe I can share with them some of the things that I've learned over the course of my career. Um, maybe I can point them to some of the people and their writings and the things that they've left and, and have available for us so we can learn from them. Uh, this is for you. Um, to those of us in our world who are busier now than ever and having to do everything through virtual meetings, um, you know, I've got resources, I would be happy to help, um, but you're probably too busy with your nose to the grindstone dealing with your current issues. So my best to everyone and uh, may we come out of this on the other side uh, better and stronger with a performance orientation. And maybe when we start producing instructional content in the future, we move as much of it as, as appropriate into performance support, also known as job aids. Uh, and when necessary, we embed those job aids and performance support in hands-on performance-based training and development. And where the performance context and the performance requirements require somebody to have something at the ready in their head, they've memorized it and they can react uh, quickly and there's no time for referencing anything or they need to really hone a skill and get really good at it. That's what training is for. We should reserve training by any means, by any media, mode and media, whether it's group paced, self paced or coached using any of the technologies that are available for us to deploy this that we reserve that expensive investment in people's development when it's absolutely necessary and not when we can find some other cheaper and sometimes more effective approach. Job aids, performance support, learning, working in the, lear in the workflow, learning in the workflow. And sometimes learning is not involved. Sometimes we just need to provide guidance and nobody needs to memorize anything or learn anything. Sometimes we provide job aids so that eventually they won't need it, they will have learned it. And if that's appropriate to the performance context and the requirements, that's the way to go. Anyway, my best to all of you. Um, again, this is Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development with me, your host, Guy Wallace. And this series is also known as the Insomnia Solution. Not my insomnia, yours. Just kidding. Cheers. Stay safe. Stay smart.